right, man. We are going live, man. Can you guys hear me? I want to make sure I'm not muted on here. Let me know if you can hear me, man. I think I'm good, man. We got Herb with some pizza. We got Mike, Janice. Happy Friday. Jess, let's do it. Hey, man, back at you. Oh, this is going to be a good one. Oh, this is going to be a good one. Uh, I'm going deep. It's Friday. Uh, you know I'm going to go deep because I got notes. That's when you know I'm going in. Rochana H. Again, let me know where you're from, man. I always like to know where you guys are from. So hit me up. We're going to chill on a Friday. We should call it Fantastic Friday for Learning or something like that. Marina Chopra. High five. And back at you. Bam. Love it. So again, let me know where you're from. Uh, we'll just wait like a minute or so, but then I'm going to jump into it. Uh, this one, you might need the notepad. And so the topic of this conversation is BYOB. That's right. BYOB, which stands for what? What does BYOB stand for? BYOB stands for, don't fail me, people. Columbus, Ohio. I did Columbus, Ohio. I've been there. I've spoken at Columbus, Ohio. I'm trying to remember the university I spoke at, but I did a S.A. Guzman. Hola from New York City, right back at you. Queens, New York. Are you old enough to remember a song called New York, New York, Big City of Dreams, but everything in New York isn't always what it seems? Remember that? Grandmaster Flash in the Furious Five, man. Bring your own Bob. Uh, access, get off the channel. You're done. Okay, bring your own. Paco Brown from Chicago. Be your own boss. I accept that one. I dig that one. Uh, so, yeah. Maybe Ohio State. It could be. It could be, Jess. Uh, it could be Ohio State. It was... Uh, but I remember, I remember we had a technology. God dang it, that's going to bother me. That's, that's going to bother me. Uh, Chris C. from Plexus. Ooh, we got Plexus coming up next month. You know, the one, not next month, in a, in a week and a half or two. Uh, that's right, man. That's right. It's something you always got, right? It's, I'm going to call it build your own business. I'll just put biz. Build your own business, man. That's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to walk you through what I consider like the A to Z blueprint. You know what I mean? This is like the A to Z blueprint. Abhinav Jahagirdar. Where are you from, man? So let me know where you're from. Uh, bring your own B. <laughs> JTI, please leave the room, man. You're done also, man. Uh, but yeah, so uh, it's going to be fun. So what I'm going to do is, here's the, here's the approach I'm going to take. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, we have an idea, right? We have an idea, and it's one of those things where you know, we just want to launch our own thing. And so for me, for example, uh, from India, man, welcome, man. Uh, you know, launching your own thing is never an easy thing. And so what you're going to get, in fact, I'm almost sure that I'm going to post this and I'll probably take it down in about a couple of days. So this is going to be one of those special deals. I'll probably put up the video and then I'm going to take it down because uh, this is going to be some heavy content and we're going to go through it. So I'm going to go really slow. TJ, Philippines, my man, welcome in. And so I'm going to give you a lot of stuff and I'm going to go through a lot of content. And so if you can just bear with me, it's going to be slow going through it. But I, but, I, but I think you'll enjoy the content. If you're a small business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a dreampreneur with the dreams of being an entrepreneur or a small business owner, this is for you. Or if you work for a company, you've been thinking, you know what? I think I want to do my own thing. Guess what? Might be a time to do your own thing, right? And so let's kind of start through it. So uh, my story was, most people don't know my story. Um, um, so my family's from Puerto Rico. Uh, so uh, they moved to Chicago in the late 50s, right? Uh, and so, you know, my mother was all about go to school, you know, get the education. If you've seen my videos, you've heard my story. By the way, I got a movie, a documentary online, free. It's called The Motivator. Let me know if you've seen it. It's called, uh, it's called the title is The Motivator. The Motivator. Is it an e echo on your side or my? I don't hear an echo. You got an echo? Hold on a second. Hold on. Oh, I think I know what it is. How about that? Just tell me, is that better? I had two mics on, that's why. Better? Yeah, I had two mics going. Give me a thumbs up just before I go any further. Cause I... All right, is it, is it gone? Is it good? Are we good? Give me a one if we're good. Before I get into this. One, two, three. Much better, much better. Everybody's much better. Cool. We're much better. Yeah, I had two microphones on. Sorry about that. And so, so our family was poor, 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 right? 
But my mother was always, go to school, get the education, get the J-O-B. Go to school, get the education, get the J-O-B. Uh, so my background is I have an electrical engineering degree and I have an MBA. And so I started in corporate America as an engineer, right? So electrical engineer, I used to design wireless systems, right? And so from wireless system, I did software development. I said systems, uh, uh, fiber optic networks, um, you know, just let's just say telecommunications. We're not boring you to death with this stuff. And so eventually I got into sales. This is a short version. So my point, uh, what I wanted to say was I have a movie. It's on, it's on uh, YouTube. It's called The Motivator. And so I don't know if you've, it's called the, uh, it's free. Uh, it's called The Motivator. And it was done about 10 years ago. The Motivator, and it's the business of selling hope. That was the subtitle. And it actually was nominated for several film festivals, actually won one international film festival, in case you didn't know. But that tells my whole story. If you want to see the whole story, you can even meet my family throughout there. But anyway, so I'm in corporate America. I decide I don't want to be an engineer. I decided to move into sales. Move into sales. I was successful in sales, became president of sales and marketing, $420 million company, did exceptionally well. But May 9th, 2001, 3.48 p.m., that's right, May 9th, 2001, 3.48 p.m., I decided to call it quits. Do my own thang. If you watch my movie, you'll know what the thang is, right? And so uh, I remember the beginning of that career was really hard because when you work for a company, you're just supposed to do a slice of the business. But now when you have to build your own business, well, now you're doing the whole thing. Right? So now it becomes really different. Now you're doing your whole thing. And, and so I really had to learn everything. So beyond being an engineer, I had to learn how to be a marketing person. I had to be sales. I got that already. But then I really had to learn all these things that, I mean, just was painful. Uh, I tell this story because it's true. Like when I quit my, my job, now keep in mind, poor, poor, poor. Food stamps, government cheese, powdered milk, right? When I became president of sales and marketing, uh, my base salary, just my base salary, was 250000 Yeah. Banking, stacking, Benjamins, cheese, Gita, Neta, all that stuff, right? And so, uh, and then commissions on top of that, and I had stock options. So when I quit, I lost all of that, right? And in my first six months, because I quit in May, started my business in June, my first six months, I netted a whopping $17,000. Let me just draw that out for you so you'll get it. So I went from $250,000 base salary, plus commission, plus stock options. In six months, I went to $17,000 net. Man, it was like, right? It was like, uh, so by the way, TJ, thank you. BYOB, Victor, you're our boss. Thank you, man. Uh, so I went like from here to here. So it was like, damn, you know, it's like, oh. And I remember, uh, that I really had to start to get my, in other words, here I am with, you know, here's what's frustrating. If I can confess, it's, it's Friday, it's confessional time, right? It's Friday confessions now. So this is like me just giving it to you straight and raw. I hope you appreciate it. So what, what was bad about it was that here I was, I had an engineering degree, had an MBA, engineer, designing software, writing software, designing wireless system, telecommunication system, fiber optic networks, da da da, present sales market, all this. And I couldn't get past that. And I'm like, you know, you, you have that moment. Like, that's when you realize that, you know, when you, what you realize is that I went from, would you write Paco? Yep, same here. Paco says I went from 150000 to twenty seven when I made my first job. That's reality. You know, this whole thing, uh, you'll be a millionaire in a year. Come on, people. This takes, you got to build this stuff, right? Paco gets it. And so... So when I quit, I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of like depressed a little bit, right? Because I'm like, I got all these credentials, all this experience, but then something hit me. Something like, like you know how just somebody just gut punches you, just bam, right in the gut. And what I realized that I was institutionalized. I think that's the only way I could put it for it, right? I was institutionalized. And what do I mean by that? That when you work for a company, let's say that's the big picture of the company, right? You're hired to do that much right there. Don't worry about the rest of the picture. You, you do that right there. And I became very good at doing that right there. And so when I jumped out on my own, I realized I didn't understand the big picture. I didn't understand marketing. I didn't understand sales real like 
battleground. See, when you're working for a company and you got a brand behind you, the brand's already well known. But when you're working for yourself, there is no brand, there is no company, you have no reputation, you have no testimonial, you have no clients, you have nothing. And I'm like, I gotta build all that up. And then everything from even like a logo. I mean, I never even thought about a logo, right? What color should I have my logo? These are things I had to start thinking about from a marketing standpoint, from a sales standpoint, what collaterals do I need? The company used to give me the collaterals and I used to go to market with those collaterals. They used to give me the PowerPoints. I used to go to market. They used to give me the case studies. There. Now I have to develop all these things. And it, it was really hard. You have to manage your own finances, right? Got to keep track of everything. What's coming in, what's going out. At that time it was very easy, right? Because not much was coming in, but a lot was going out. And so all that was like, you know, uh, somebody asked me, were you married at the time with kids? Yes, two kids, right? Two kids and a mortgage. You know what I mean? Now, the good thing was, full disclosure here, I had some money put away in the bank. But man, Arvin, that money was doing this. Boof, boof, you know, because initially it was like, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll spend a little money doing this. But man, you burn through money quick. If you started your own business, you know that there's so many unexpected expenses that, man, you're burning money. Yeah, a J-O-B, right? Just over broke, that's what most people are. Um, and so I had to kind of rethink this. After the first six months, I'm like, this is not, you know, I had to really start reevaluating. And you start doubting your skill sets. Now here I am with all these credentials and I'm doubting my skill sets. And so it was then that I really started taking everything, I guess, I'm not gonna say more seriously, but I just said, I really need to focus in on what works and what doesn't work. And just like many of you, you've probably spent a lot of money on training programs, right? You go to these seminars, you go to these coaches that'll promise you, you know, you'll make a million dollars or whatever, you know what I mean? I'll turn your life around a whole bit. And you're like, they're so full of, you know what I'm talking about. They're full of sugar, honey, iced tea. Did you get that? Because that's what they're full of. Sugar, honey, iced tea. That's what they're full of. And most, most of these people, you know, because of that, because of that, you, you wind up blowing through money, man. You, and again, everybody promises you anything. Here's the problem. Everybody tells you what you need to do. They just don't show you how to do it. Now really, I mean, next time you listen to a, a guru or an expert, realize that most of them tell you what you need to do, but they don't tell you how to do it. And even if they told you how to do it, the timeline they give you is so dishonest because they, they raise your expectations. Now here's the vicious cycle you get into because let's say you invested some money, right? You listen to this guru, expert, right? The, you, know, the, you know, and you listen to them and you bought into their program, right? Because that's what I did. By the way, I did the same thing, so I am with you. And then what happens is you follow the program. You, fo you do exactly what they said you need to do. You follow the program, right? But then the results are not the same. And there's many reasons why it's not the same, you know, because what happens to one person may not happen to another. Sometimes it's not duplicatable. That's what they don't tell you. That sometimes it's simply not duplicatable. They were in the right time, in the right place, and something wonderful happened to them. It's called an outlier effect. If you read the book by Malcolm Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote The Tipping Point, you should read Outlier. That is one of the best books, Golden Shelf book. If you know my Golden Shelf, where the best books are at. Outlier, better than the tipping point. Outlier is the book because it explains that a lot of successful people, if they were to erase the board, take all their money away and say, all right, do it again, they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They simply could not do it. Now, I'm not saying everybody, but the majority of them couldn't do it. Why? If you look at Bill Gates, that's an interesting story. Bill Gates came from a, a nice prominent family. Good for him. But when he started programming at the time, I think there were only four like large computers and he had access in the, in the US and he had access to one. And so he had a head start. So that's what they call an outlier effect. An outlier effect is something that happens that puts you in a position of advantage and that advantage builds over time that it generates this success. I am not saying he didn't earn it. Of course he earned it. But if we were to start from zero again today, if I were to take all of Bill's money, start him from zero, says go. I don't know. The only person I know that, that, that did it again was Steve Jobs. But remember, Steve wasn't started from zero this time. He had some money in the bank. That's the only difference. Anyway, I digress because my point is that all these people will offer you these programs and a lot of these programs simply, you know, they work for them. They're not lying. They worked for them, but they may not work for you. And then what happens is here's where the vicious cycle, here's where you got to be careful because here's where your self-esteem will take a blow. 
because you do it, it doesn't work out. Then you start going, am I an idiot? Why, why, why can't I figure this out? He did, she did it, why can't I do it? And all of a sudden you start doubting yourself. And then you do one of two things. One is you stop trying. It happens, right? People give up very quickly on their dreams, man. Give up very quickly. And I think the big reason people give up on their dreams is not that they can't do it. It's just that the timeline is distorted. Let me, let me explain this. this is a, it's an interesting concept. The timeline is distorted. By that I mean is they, you have or they've put in your head an expectation of when you think you should be successful. Like if it was a metric, like an empirical number, something you can actually measure, but you can't. And so when you don't hit it within a certain time frame, you just give up. And you could have been so close to making it. You could have been so close. So you focus on making it at a certain time that when you don't feel that you're progressing fast enough because you're comparing yourself to other people, that's one of the big problems. We compare ourselves too much. Social media, for example, you know, Trashlandia, I should call it, because the majority of people who are posting stuff on social media, I'm going to believe half of half of what they say. I'm sorry, that's just me. Give me a one if you're with me. Give me a zero if you disagree. That's cool too. So my, my point is that these unrealistic expectations are set and then you you fall for it. And then when it doesn't work out for you, you get depressed. You know, you're like, oh God, I, you know, I, I just stink at this. I'm not good at this. I knew I couldn't do it. And then people are in your ear all the time, right? People are in your ear all the time. 0.5, you're too funny. I love that one. A 0.5 is good actually. I love that one, Arvin. So, but you know what? People are in your ear all the time about you can't do it. You can't make it. And what I realized, and I had this in one of my speeches, that dream killers, people who go after your dreams, dream killers, people who go after your dreams, they don't just tell you it's not going to work. Nope. That's not how dream killers work. That's not how naysayers work. Here's how they work. They're like stealth. Do you know what I mean? It's not, it's not what they say. It's what they don't say. Like they'll say things like, I mean, you know, you present your idea and they'll go, yeah, I, I get, yeah, that's, I mean, it could work. And then you, you see that, you hear that, and then you start doubting yourself. Then you ask somebody else their opinion and they go, yeah, I, I, I've just never seen anybody do it that way. So I, maybe it'll work. You know, try it. And then you're like, you start doubting yourself. You ever have that? People just start like, again, they're not trying to kill your dream. But what they're saying is not helping you. And part of it is you're asking the wrong people. But that's another topic again. But anyway, back to my point is that too often we think we should be faster or more headed and we're comparing ourselves. And that comparison is what I, I think one of the biggest evils of the brain. That thing up here is that it's, it's irresistible urge to always compare itself with somebody else. We all do it. That's part of our survival mechanism, right? Comparing things is part of our survival mechanism. For example, if you're walking down the forest, you see the bush move. Well, that bush wasn't moving. You noticed it. So you compared it with, it wasn't moving. Now it's moving, maybe danger. And so my point to you is we always compare ourselves with other people. What if you just lived in your own bubble? What if you establish your own time frame for success? and just did it at your pace, ran at your speed. Because that's what I had to finally adopt to. So what I said to myself, six months into the deal, I'm making $17,000, right? Two kids in school, private school, mortgage, I'm paying, my money's doing this, right? And I'm not even gonna tell you about what happened in 2007, 2008. By the way, around 2001, when this happened, also the internet bubble happened. And so a lot of the stock I had also devalued. So it was just going, it was going, it was, it was, it was, it was a sugar, honey, iced tea storm. Do you know what I mean? It was that. And so all of a sudden I'm like, oh, so now the market's going bad. And remember 2001, I just told you May 9th, 2001, September 11th, 2001 hit after that. And the market went even worse. And it was like that whole year was almost catastrophic for me. Right. And still at the end of the year, this is why I made 17,000. I said to myself, okay, I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out. And I'm sharing this with you because when you hear it from somebody like me, and I've heard this from many other honest entrepreneurs and business people, you hear these stories. And so when it happens to you, you'll be able to go, well, he had bad luck. He had bad luck. All these, I want, this is real talk here. This is not me just trying to like polish you up and says, man, you can do it. You're the best. You can grade it. You can make it. You can just put mind to it. Be passionate. Pursue your passion. You can do it. <sighs> if it was only that easy. You know, people always say, pursue your passion. Pursue your passion. That is, okay. So let me just clarify why I don't like that phrase. 
because that, 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 I have a visceral reaction when I hear pursue your passion. Because when you say pursue your passion, pursue your passion is a narcissistic, egoistic, or egocentric approach to business. So why don't you try this phrase? Why don't you pursue your passion as long as it adds value to the market? Pursue your passion in such a way that it adds value to the market. For example, love sales training. Love, love, love sales training. And I also know what value it delivers to the market. Now, I could pick a hobby. I don't know. Let's say I want to study the history of ants. Yeah, the history of ants. That's my passion. I want to study the history of ants. I'm making this up. Now, that's not going to add a lot of value to the market. I might get a job at a, at a, you know, at a university, but that's about it. It's not adding any value. So be careful when you say pursue your passion. Pursue your passion in a situation where it adds value to the market so you can love what you're doing, but then because you're providing value, you get value in return. Therein lies the win-win. Therein lies the win-win. That's the real mindset for winning in business. And so when I became a speaker, uh, again, the documentary, The Motivator, check it out, tells the whole story. Uh, short story is I saw Zig Ziglar speak years ago, and I was like, I want to do that one day. So May 9, 2001, 3.48 p.m., I decided I'm going to do it my thing. And then again, first six months, $17,000. From there to there, not good, not good. And so... At that point, I started really thinking about how do I approach this business? And so what I want to do is when I talk about this BYOB, build your own business, I'm just going to give you some steps, some stepping stones here, right? And so this is, uh, you know, this is just me talking to you. I'm not charging you for it. So therefore, there is no interest here for me, okay? There is no self-interest here. I'm just, I just want to give this shit, man. Put it out in the universe, man. Because I think if you hear some of this stuff and you, you'll begin to think for yourself, look, you know, they got these folks who will sell these packages. I got, I got an email, true story, not making this up. Uh, and if you're on this uh, live, you can actually say, it's me, Victor. But I was talking to, um, I got the email from a, a young guy. He was from the UK, from the UK. He says, said, Victor, he says, I just bought your Sales Velocity Academy. This thing right here, in case you, by the way, before I forget. That, that thing right there. there. And, and if you haven't subscribed, subscribe, 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 right? right? The, the Sales Velocity, Velocity Academy. Academy. And, and so, so he said, said he said, I want to thank you for making it affordable. affordable. I'm not trying to sell you here. Please, I'm not trying to sell you, okay? Just let me finish this part because it ties into what I just said. He says, thank you for making it affordable. I just looked at X person, not going to mention the name, X person sales training, right? And they were charging me. And he said, they were charging me. They wanted to charge, it was like $2,300. $2,300, um, by the way, it was in pounds, so it might be a little more, right? It was in pounds. And so it's echoing again for some reason. My microphone turned on again. Thank you for the heads up. Appreciate you guys. Man, you guys just keep me honest. I love it, man. Thank you, man. Feel that. And so he said it was like 2,300 pounds, and then they wanted to upsell them into a coaching program. Now, I know that person's training program. I'm just saying it's not worth that because I know what's in it, and I've seen what's in it, and a lot of the stuff you can just go to Amazon and buy it in a book, right? They just went, got a book, put it in some videos, and there you go. And so, you know, I want to give you this because I just want you to enjoy this free content, and hopefully this will give you some structure for building your business. So if right now you're struggling, you don't have a lot of extra money, you're trying to make ends meet, you got a family, but you want to do your own thing, right? This is for you tonight. So I'm glad you, you're hanging out with me on a Friday because it's going to get real, okay? And so I'm going to, and by the way, so let's have an agreement. You and I are going to have an agreement right now. Ask me the toughest questions you want. Don't even care. Blunt. Let's be friends. Let's be family tonight. What do you say? Family Friday? Let's be family. Ask questions. And by the way, if you can answer somebody else's question, by the way, share your information, okay? Don't sell anybody here. We're not here to sell people, but just share. If you see somebody else make a comment and you want to add something, throw something in the comment, okay? Let's help each other out. Let's hang out on this Friday and brainstorm. So let's start with, I think the first thing you have to decide is, again, you have to figure out that combination, right? What is that combination? That combination is, you know, what is it that you want to do? So let's get, let's get the passion piece down, right? 
And this is where you have to do some soul searching. You know, what's your passion? But that could also make you what? Money. Now, when I say make money, I'm like the ultimate capitalist. I'm like an Ayn Rand capitalist. You know who Ayn Rand is? If you're a true capitalist, you know who Ayn Rand is. Ayn Rand, oh, well, that's a Y, Ayn Rand. By the way, be warned, Ayn Rand is a heavy read, heavy read. Uh, Ayn Rand, I think, came from Russia in the 50s. She had seen communism. She had seen socialism. And when she came to America, I'm telling you, she got it. She got it. And so if you're into, uh, you know, really thoughtful reading, but it's heavy, it's heavy. If you read Ayn Rand, hit me with the one. She has a book called uh, Atlas Shrug and the Fountainhead. Powerful books, man. If you ask me who is my favorite author, period, Ayn Rand, right? And so again, it's heavy reading though. The, so she gave me a philosophy. She has what, what is known as the philosophy of objectivism. This is where I'm going with this. Her philosophy of objectivism is, so that's Ayn Rand, so let me just erase this. Her philosophy of objectivism is see things for what they are. Just see things for what they are. Don't, don't imagine things, see it for what they are. So she has the equation A equals A. She says, just see it for what it is. But Ayn Rand says something interesting. Somebody read Atlas Shrugged. Uh, stopped comparing myself to others three years ago after discovering Victor Antonio. Way to go, man. Ayn Rand said something interesting. In any relationship, be it personal or professional, listen to this, because this, this little phrase, this little phrase, I can't tell you how it freed me. I mean, when I'm talking about, you know how people try to put their hooks in you? Do you know what I mean by that? People put their hooks in you? Yeah, man, I did you a favor, man. Why don't you hook me up? Or they try to find ways to make you feel guilty. I call that, they're putting hooks in you because they want to pull you in their direction. When I read this phrase by Ayn Rand, I swear to you, I, it was the unhooking of everything. And she said, every relationship, very simple, should be value for value. And now, if you just read that statement by itself, it may, it may not make any sense, but let me explain it to you and then it'll give you the context. She said, when a relationship is value for value, both people are in exchanging of value. You appreciate the value and they appreciate your value. That is the perfect relationship. So whether it's in business, value for value, or in a relationship, marriage, right? Value for value. And when there's always value for value, we're helping each other. That's the perfect balance. That, she says, is true capitalism. I guess you can call it true marital capitalism. I don't know. But so what does that mean? This is where the unhooking came from. When I started analyzing a lot of the relationships I had, a lot of the relationships, I'm talking professional relationship. Uh, me and my wife have had a great value for value relationship. We've been together since 86. What does that make us? 34 years together. 34 years and 32 years married. My best friend, right? A great, the ultimate value for value equation. And so, but in my professional life, I started, when I heard that phrase, I started asking myself, where are the value for value relationships? Like you, you have a friend, I'm sure you have at least one friend who, you know, you do them a favor and they'll, they'll wind up doing something back, not because they feel they have to reciprocate, it's just because who they are. You probably have a client Clients, again, clients will buy from you. You'll give them value in return. I sell sales training. It's Victor, we love you. Can you give us more of that sales training? Because we're, we're selling more. That's the value for value. I want you to keep that in mind. So as you're thinking about your product, right? As you're thinking about your product, I want you to think about this. If it's value for value, right? What, what, is, what do you like? Eric's in the house. What's happening, sales boss? Papa Klein and I watching. Papa Klein, what's happening? Uh, Eric Klein is a good friend out of, he's in Fo Florida right now. I think he's in Boca, right? His father, I think is, yeah, he's up there in A. Let's say a couple of years ago. Uh, he's up there, so thank you for joining me. I've not met you yet. That's a high five, virtual high five to Papa Klein. But um, <clears throat> so my point is, is that what do you love to do that you can make money at? I think that's it. You start there. Now, you don't have to consult anybody. Listen to me. You don't have to pay anybody for this. Here's what you do. You look for these two words. This is what you're looking for. If you find this, you're good. You look for something called social proof. What is social proof? 
This is a phrase made famous by Robert Cialdini in his book, Influence. But social proof is this. If you see something happening, that's proof that it's possible. This is subtle, but listen to this. When I saw Zig Ziglar speak, and I figured that guy must be making a lot of money. And when I found out how much Zig Ziglar was making, right, I think at the time, he was probably in the 50, 60 range. By the time I finally got, you know, fast forward, it's another story, I got to share the stage with Zig Ziglar. What happened was, he, I think he was making like 125 dollars to $150,000 a speech, per speech social proof. But I wasn't thinking that high. I, was, I wasn't at that level yet. But I'm like, wait a minute. So and then I started researching for me, speakers, speakers and trainers. And I started figuring out, well, how much do they make? Because I, I, I love to speak, love to do training, love to do sales training. You know, love to motivate people, sales motivation, sales motivation. Those are my two key words, right? And so I said, you know, who's, are they making money? And when I found out they were making money, that was all the social proof I needed. Think about this. If somebody's doing it, if somebody's making money, there's a way to make money. You, know, you don't have to consult with anybody. People say, well, I gotta sit down and talk to somebody about this. Uh, let me see, Chris Atkey was just telling my, wait a minute, wait a minute, who's this guy? So Greg Cardone, Don, all these people, you are the most real, love show on your team. Ah, thank you, man, I appreciate that. Frank, you got it, Ayn Rand, objectivism, right? Um, so if you see people doing it, Figure out what you love to do, right? Right? And then figure out, can they make people make money? And again, there's gonna be some careers that you have to be realistic about though. If you have no, no leaping skills, you're not gonna make it in the NBA. And if you're over 35, you're definitely not gonna make it in the NBA, right? There's certain things that we're just not equipped to do. That's okay, right? That is okay. The thing is, right here, when you're looking at your passion, it's almost like you have to look at your passion, but then you have to do an inventory. See, the inventory should almost be right before this. Like, what are you good at? Because here's the myth. I'm gonna shatter a myth. You shouldn't pursue your passion. No, no, you shouldn't pursue your passion. The, the real irony is this. You, you should look at your inventory, what you're good at. Because once you figure out what you're good at, what you realize that people pay you for what you're good at. And because you're good at it, it is effortless. Because it is effortless, you love to do it. And because you love to do it, you love to learn more about what you're doing. But also what happens is people start noticing that you're good at it. And because people start noticing that you're good at it, they start paying you more money and more attention. And we as human beings want that. Recognition, attention, money, right? And so what happens is now you really start loving what you're doing because you're getting the feedback. Think about this for a second. You're getting the feedback. You're getting, I don't want to say adoration in the wrong way, but you're getting appreciation. And then people show you the appreciation. They want you to stay. They want to do business with you. They are willing to pay you a little extra more. And then this beautiful, not vicious cycle, but this virtuous cycle is created. And all of a sudden you love it. If you really want to read more on this, the one that the book that opened my eyes to this was uh, Daniel Pink. Daniel Pink wrote a book called Drive. Drive, like drive, right? And in the book, he figures out that money isn't the ultimate motivator. Money isn't the ultimate motivator. But what it is, he says, you got to look beyond the money. Why do people want to, you know, basically do what they do? The passion. Excuse me. Then he introduces a phrase that maybe you've never heard of, the third drive. It's a beautiful phrase, the third drive. And the third drive is this. There are, we all as human beings have biological needs, right? I don't need to go into detail what the biological needs is. Anything from hunger, you know what I'm talking about, everything, right? We have biological needs. He says, that's the first drive. He says, then people try to entice us with rewards or they try to scare us with punishment. These are external influences on our motivation. External influences on our motivation. He says that's called the second drive. External drives, right? But he said the one that most people don't talk about is the internal drive, the third drive. And the third drive is you do it because you want to do it, because it makes you feel good, because it's effortless. 
So you know how when people say, you know, if you do what you love, you'll never have to work a day in your life. Again, that's true, but let's apply a little critical thinking here. I love to eat all day, but if I eat all day, I'm telling you, nobody's gonna pay me for that. But if I do something, if I eat all day, write a review on that food, create videos around that food, and then post those things, and sell my book, and sell my products, my recipes, whatever, then there's the, there's the link. I've pursued my passion, but I also created the passion to allow value to be delivered to the market. That's what you have to keep in mind. Did I go too long on that? Let me know if I went too long on that. Uh, let me see, uh, you make me laugh, Victor. It's so true that Shane, I created this with sales. Cool. The law of reciprocity, man, it is there, man. By the way, am I, am I babbling on a Friday or is this making sense? Sometimes I, you know, I'm in this room going, do they care? Do they not care? I don't know. So anyway, let me just read some of these because I just want to. Uh, Soab says, I'm a lifetime member. Thank you, man. Zalom. He says, Soab Zalom. Uh, you need to be there, guys. It's worth it. Thank you, man. Uh, all right. Making sense so far. So anyway, so the, so the first part is figure out what this is. But again, a lot of it has to do with what are you good at, man? What are you, what are you good at? What do you like doing? Just like doing inventory. What do you like doing, man? What do you like doing? And just start there. And the thing is, I mean, I got an engineering degree. It has nothing to do with speaking on sales. It has nothing to do. It started here, ended up here. And so people always say, like, another phrase I had, since it's Friday, let's just count it. I'm going to call this frustrating Friday, too. Frustrating Friday. Here's my frustrating thing. I hate when people say, uh, an education, uh, you know, you don't need a college degree to be successful. All right. Again, let's apply some critical thinking. Every time I hear absolutes, that's my, I, I got a pet peeve. When people talk about absolutes, I hate absolutes. Like that'll never work. You can't do that. Really? Uh, you in order you don't have to go to college to be successful. I said I, I get that, but let, let's kind of let's kind of slice and dice this thing a little bit here. Now again, I got an electrical engineering degree. I can tell you, I am a living testament that that return on investment was awesome and still continues to pay dividends today. Right? Even what sales or training. You know, I can't even tell you how many times I've gone to speak to a technology company and they don't even expect me to be engineering-like until I start getting into it. They're like, oh, love this guy, let's bring him back and they pay me more money, right? So that degree has paid off in spades. I mean, like, it's amazing what that thing has done for me, right? But I know people who've gotten degrees, let's go to the other extreme now, who got a degree in something that the market really doesn't value. I'm not saying it doesn't have value, Notice I'm carefully parsing those. It has value, but the market doesn't perceive the value. For example, studying the history of ants, making that up just to be extreme, right? So really, the real statement should be, if you're going to get a college degree, make sure there's a return on an investment on that degree. Like today, if you're a programmer, if you know anything about CX design or UX design, you're going to make money, a lot of money. Right? If you know anything about machine learning, if you're a data scientist, right? you're in the artificial intelligence, you're going to make money. You can't help it. So again, there are areas where you can make a lot of money. Now, let's look at no degrees. It is not necessary. There is no requirement needed to be a millionaire to be successful. You don't need a college degree. I agree. You don't need a college. It's not a requirement. Because I know many people who've dropped out of college. Hell, I know a couple of people who've dropped out of high school who basically are killing it, making more money than I am. And I'm all good with that, right? So you don't need it. You don't need it. It's not a requirement. That's the way they said. A success does not require a college degree. Or, but the, what they don't tell you is, let's go over here. So a lot of people don't get a college degree. I forgot what the number is, but I think it's like, I think like 70% of the population doesn't have a college degree, something like that right? 70% of the population. Here's what nobody wants to talk about, is that the many people who don't have college degrees are trapped in their jobs, and they're living that life of quiet desperation. Yeah, you'll hear about the millionaire who came out of high school, dropped out of college, made the bazillions, right? He did it. Outlier effect, Malcolm Gladwell. But again, there's a lot of people that simply didn't make it. So I'm not for or against a college degree. I'm not for or against staying in college either. So if you don't want to do it, I'm always like, do you need it? No. But do you have what it takes, literally, I mean, in here, the inventory piece,
to go without the degree. If you do, then you don't need it maybe. You don't need, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the right answer is. But be careful when people say, you need this or you don't need that. I'm like, well, it depends. What am I trying to do? So I highlight this for you. Figure out what your inventory is. So what are you good at? Early on, I found out that I was very good at speaking, right? And then when I saw Zig Ziglar, it's like, hmm, hmm, yeah, these two things go together. I can make money doing that, right? And so you got to figure out what you're good at. And, but you got to be, you know, also, if you're going to do something like this, make sure you become the best at it. Do you know what I mean by that? You become a domain expert. And what I mean by a domain expert is that you, you, tr you really learn it. Like me, I marinate in sales. Do you know what I mean? I'm reading all the time. Two to three books a month, easy. I'm reading constantly. I'm writing books. I've written 14 books. I love this thing. I love it, but I'm always learning. I love, especially, I love listening to millennials. Gen Xers and millennials love listening to it. I don't want to be the old guy in the room. I love listening to them. I love learning from them because in my brain, I want, I want to be the best of the best of the best. And so I don't want to keep recycling you know, the, the same information. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's too many people out there just recycling the same content over and over again. You know, if I hear another motivational speaker talk to me about, again, pursue your passion, got to believe in yourself. Thank you. I didn't know that. Never thought of that idea. Uh, I shouldn't give up. Thank you. You need to make it happen. I appreciate that too. These things don't help. They're like ethereal ether. They're like benevolent bromides, right? Things that really don't help. They're the what. They're not the how. They're the what. It's not the how. So first step in the how is to be honest with yourself, which is tough. This is tough. People don't talk about it. It's hard to be honest with yourself because you have to do the inventory and you have to do the, I stink at this, but I'm really good at this. I stink at this, but I'm really good at that. So forth and so on. Somebody wrote, that's something uh, developing countries do experience. Getting a college degree really makes a difference between economic advancement or not. Yeah, and it depends on the country. Uh, we used to live, uh, Gadget Double O, we used to live in Argentina. In Argentina, I can't tell you how many cab drivers drove me around that had PhDs because college was free. Yeah, state paid for it. College was free. Everybody had a degree, but they were driving taxis, right? And again, the, one of the things I, if I have a bone to pick with the, with the education system is that they don't take, teach us one, critical thinking. Two, they don't teach us about financing. Three, they don't teach us about entrepreneurs, tr uh, entrepreneurship or entrepreneurialism, right? Because think about it, all, the school system here, and I'm talking about the, here in the US, is still set in like the industrial revolution. Do you know what I mean? You, I, I don't know if you realize this, but the school system is still set up like for the Industrial Revolution where muscle and mass made money. But it's, it's different today, right? And so we need to learn different. We need to restructure the actual learning system. It's not working. And that's, I think, my, my bone to pick is because people graduate from high school or college without understanding finances, without critical thinking skills, and without being able to start their own business. Imagine if you're taught from, instead of, you know how people say, go to school, get the education, get the great job. Go to school, get the education, get the great job. That's, that's like handing you the script. You know what I mean? It's, it's like your program. What if they did this? Hey, go to school, learn how to start your own business, screw working for somebody else, build your millions, do it on your own. Oh, wait a minute, I kinda like that program better, right? Because it's not about getting a job, it's about how do you build your stuff. I mean, how many entrepreneur classes did you have in high school or college? Imagine if we started taking entrepreneur classes in like elementary school. Now, before you laugh at me, here there's a program, uh, what was the name? It's something with the seed. And basically at the seventh or eighth grade, they start teaching students how to buy and sell products and actually sell. So they have to hit certain revenue numbers. So imagine that if they had to do this. By the way, one of the things, if I can just share, is that they go to a place like Costco, right? And they try to find things, they teach the kids, okay, let's find things at discounts below market cost, right? And then you'll have to turn around and sell it. Now you can make, you can add things, package them up, do whatever you want, but you gotta figure out how to sell it. And so it's really cool how they teach them that. Imagine if we were programmed that way. You know what I mean? Imagine if we were programmed that way, instead of just go to school, get the education, get the JLP, which is why I made, which is why I made $17,000, right? Because I was programmed by the system, okay? So now you got this, step one. So let's assume that you got that down. 
you got that down. I know what I want to do. And let me see, what can we say? I'll do, I'll use the speaking business for me. Can I just use the speaking business? So I decided I want to be a speaker, right? So boom, I'm gonna be a speaker, be a sales trainer, be a speaker, sales trainer. Got it. Start studying it, right? I, the speaking part, I just got better over time. I practiced my speeches. I really practice like a lot. I walk around the house doing this. Yeah, you know, it's, it's weird at times. My, my wife just looks at me like, all right. You know, now she's used to it. She's like, eh. you know, but my point is I'm there all the time. I'm in it because I love it. That whole thing, it's, it's, it's what I love doing, right? And so I got better and better. But when I started out, nobody knew who I was. I couldn't even give away my speeches for free. Like literally, I couldn't give them away for free. I mean, nobody, I would say, hey, I'd love to come to your school and speak. Who are you? I mean, I couldn't give them away for free. And so at that point, again, this is when I made that $17,000 where I had to really figure out how to do this stuff. And so I started looking at it. I, I, it's almost like I had a moment because I was buying everybody's programs and I realized a lot of these gurus were giving me crap. I mean, it was just stuff I couldn't really use. And then I had a, this, don't laugh, this, this was a true moment. It's like, I'm just being open here. I had a moment where I said, wait a minute, why am I asking other people for opinions on running a business when I just, present sales and market, 420 men, engineering degree, MBA, I know how to do this, but I was unsure of myself because I never had to do it by myself. Does that make sense? I was unsure of myself because I, I, this is the first time I had to do it by myself. So, I, so buying programs from other gurus was almost like a security blanket, right? It's almost like some type of insurance policy. Well, if I buy from him, that will ensure that I'll be successful. But over and over again, I kept seeing it for what it was. I kept reading this, I said, it's junk. I know that, I know that, I know that. And it was like, really, this is not a blueprint. It's more like a, an outline, right? If you know what I'm talking about, hit a wand. When people say they got a blueprint, well, they really just have an outline, big difference. And so at that point, I said, you know what? Let me just apply my business brain to this thing and figure it out. And I said, let me look at being a speaker, being a trainer, being a consultant strategically. And so step one in the strategic process. See, I'm not gonna tell you what you gotta do. I'm gonna show you how to do it. So here's what I did. So I figured out I had to pick. This was tough for me. I had to pick what I wanted to talk about. I can motivate people. I can do that. Uh, I'm a good internet marketer now, super internet marketer. I can do that too. Uh, most of you don't know, but like designing graphics, stuff like that, can do that well. I can write well. I can do a, I can do a lot of good things, a lot well, right? I can do them well. But I said, what do I really want to do? Because I got to pick one. See, I can't be, you can't serve more than one master. There's only one way of putting that, right? You can't serve more than one master. You can't divide yourself. So then I just said, I said sales. And as soon as I said sales and I bought into it, and I don't have it with me, it's downstairs in my office, but I actually signed a contract with myself. I said, we will only talk about sales. We will not do, you know, all this other stuff. If you call me up, says, Victor, uh, can you talk about, you know, teamwork? Nope, not what I do. If you say, Victor, can, we talk, can you talk to me about customer service? Nope, not what I do. It's because I know this is what I do. So I made a commitment to be that guy, right? Literally, like, okay, so then, What's the next step? If you know that that's who you want to be, this is you, then you got to understand what? You got it. Who is the competition, right? Who's out there? I won't name any names, but I remember when I told people, I said, you know what? I'm going to dedicate myself to sales training, build my company around sales training, so forth and so on. And people are like, well, you realize that this person's out there and they're way ahead of you, Victor. This guy has like five books, da, 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 da. This guy's been around for 20 years. And they kept doing that whole thing. And again, it, it, they said it in a way not to kill my dreams. They, were, they thought they were helping me. You know how people want to help you by telling you what you can't do, <laughs> what your competition is all about? And I go, I get that. But see, in here, right here, right here, the decision was made. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean by that? It was full bone, it was, it was like Texas, you know, all in, chips all in. And my question to you is, if you can't push your chips all in, don't do it. Stay with your day job. I know that sounds hard, I'm not trying to be mean, I'm not. It's just maybe the timing's not right. Your frustration level isn't there. Your quiet discontent isn't great enough yet. Then don't do it, don't do it. Because unless you're willing to go like that, 
And once you're able to go like that and look at your wife says, oh, I'm going to make it. I'm going to figure this thing out and have that dead look in your eye. Like, I'm gonna, you know, that look, unless you have that, you're not going to make it because something happens when you go all in. It's like when you buy a car. You ever notice when you buy a car for the first time, let's say you went out tonight or in the morning and you bought a car, right? What do you notice when you get on the road? What do you notice? You notice that same car, right? You know, because it's your car. You own that car. So now you notice any, everybody else who has that car. That's exactly what happens when you go all in. See, when you go all in, you start seeing things that you didn't see before because now you're focused on it. Now you've taken ownership, just like you took ownership of that car. You've now taken ownership of what you're going to do. And when you take ownership of what you're going to do, you start noticing everything that has to do with what you've gone all in on. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I'm telling you, that is, I think, where the magic lies, if I can use the word. Because once you go all in, it's like, believe it or not, you begin to become more efficient. Marketing becomes more what? Your sales pitch becomes more what? People try to distract you. Hey, do you want to do this? Do you want to try this? Do you want to join my business? No, I'm doing this. Leave me alone. I'm doing this. I'm all in. And this, people can't distract you. I can't tell you how many offers I get. Every week, I get at least one offer, minimum, one offer. Hey, Victor, I got an idea for you. Want to run by, see you want to be part of this, whatever. Does it have to do with sales? They go, no, don't want to talk about it. He goes, can we at least show it to you? No, don't want to talk about it. I've probably missed out on great opportunities. I don't think so, but maybe. But that's how much all in I'm in. And if you ask me, am I happy where I'm at? Oh, I'm happy. I'm very happy. But it took that, that takes a lot of courage. You know what I mean? It takes a lot of courage to push that all in like that. Because, but again, unless you're willing to do that, and if you're not willing to do that, don't do it. Don't jump out of your job. Don't start investing. Don't start dabbling. Don't start like, I'm just going to dip my toe, Victor, and just see. No, we don't dip toes. Either you jump in or you don't. Now, by the way, I'm not saying research at first. Of course, you're going to research at first. But there's, before you put any money down, research. And today, research is free. Stop paying people to tell you what you want to do. That's the, the irony, the paradox sometimes, the, 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 the asinine aspect of this sometimes. We pay other people to tell us what we should be doing. When you know, if you're honest enough with yourself, what you like to do, what you don't like to do. It just takes courage to admit what you're not good at, what you're good at. And then when you find it, whew. now, by the way, let me give you a time frame for this. This doesn't happen like you just wake up one day, just bam. I guess it could happen if you wake up one day, but it doesn't happen overnight. So what happens is over time you're thinking about it. This idea, it's like a hobgoblin in the mind. It just stays there, man. It just whirls. You know what I mean? It just, it just keeps whirling. And then, I don't know what it is, but you ever see the movie by Russell Crowe? It's a Beautiful Mind. Do you remember that movie? And do you remember there's a scene where, because he's such a genius in the movie, right? He starts seeing these numbers floating around. Just starts seeing numbers floating around. And then all of a sudden, he's like, there's the answer. It's kind of like that. You know what I mean? In an esoteric sense, it's kind of like that. The one that you wake up, you go, got it. But the only way you can get to this is if you consume content. Because when you don't consume content, again, think of your brain as having furniture in there. And when you don't read, when you don't study, or when you don't listen to awesome live streams like this, all you're doing is moving the furniture around in your brain. And that'll never get you to where you want to go. This is why, again, you got to really commit to learning. And we talked about this last time. 1% of your time, which is 1,440 minutes every day, is only 14.4 minutes, 15 minutes every day. That's 1% of your time every day. If you can just dedicate 15 minutes, because when you read something, it's like adding new furniture and you realize, hey, I like this new furniture better. Let me get rid of this old furniture. And then all of a sudden you start liking your furniture and then all of a sudden the house is set and now you're ready to begin. So keep that in mind. OK, so sales. I started studying the competition. I started doing what they did again. Social proof. OK, social proof. This is exactly what I did. So I go, OK, so we got Zig Ziglar. Uh, let me see. At that time, uh, Jim Rohn, another, I love Jim Rohn, um, uh, Jeffrey Gittimer, uh, you have Brian Tracy, 
uh, Winget uh, was out there. Uh, just a lot of great speakers. Uh, I'm trying to remember a couple more. And I went, uh, 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 uh. And all I did, and all I did was, I go, what are they doing? Like, what are the common denominators to their success? Oh, they have a website. Boom. Got to build me a website. Build a website. Oh, got to have brochures. Got to have brochures. Got to get that. Hey, I see they have branding. Oh, what's branding? I don't know. So they need a logo with some colors. Okay, well, let's, let's figure that out too, right? So I started studying that. Anyway, developed a logo, right? Everybody was like orange and gray. That was my first logo, right? And so everything was orange and gray, orange and gray, orange and gray. And then so I have that. What else? Oh, they have... Oh, they have a book. Ah, oh, dang it. I got to write a book. Now I got to write a book. So now I start, got to write a book. And I am horrible at writing. You have to understand that I'm horrible at writing because, so at home we learn Spanish, right? So it was all Spanish at home, right? And then when I left the house, it was English, right? And, but my brain is, is still wrestling with this stuff sometimes, right? Like sometimes I, you know, you know how the adjectives goes before the noun, but in Spanish it's the noun, then the adjectives. So it's, I still flip things around. And when I went to in college, I mean, I got like a, I, like, I got like a C minus in English. I mean, I'm just like horrible, right? And so, but my brain said, we're all in. Are we all in, Victor? And I was like, I think we are. I said, we're all in. I said, well, then we got to start writing. And so I remember I wrote my first book. And the person that edited my book, I think they regretted picking it up, I swear to you, because they probably looked, went through a couple of pages and goes, what did I sign up for? And I, I, I'm still, I think, a bad writer, but I don't care. Do you know what I mean? Because there's other people out there who can edit my stuff and make me sound good. All I want to do is make sure they get my concepts down. So don't let that stop you, right? There's all kinds of websites out there to help you edit stuff. So I wrote a book. Got it. I wrote it. What else do I need to do? Right? Okay. And then I started studying, like literally studying how they spoke. Whether it was whether it was the storytelling, cadences, how they changed their voice, loud to real soft, dropping offers, but you know, or stuff like that. How they told the story, you know, the drama in it, right? And then how like for for, for me, Zig Ziglar's is is like, you know, when you watch a Zig Ziglar move on stage. It was like, look at this guy move. It's just the way he moves. When he tells a story, his whole body's in the story. I mean, I've even taken uh, improv classes. Yes, I took an eight-week improv course just to get better at speaking. See what I mean? When you're all in, you're all in. You'll take a speaking. Man, if I, if I thought ballet would help me with my speaking, I'd take a ballet class. I wouldn't wear the tutu or the tights, but I'll take it. My point is, whatever you have to do to become better, try to find different ways to add to your repertoire. This goes back to the furniture analogy, right? And so the improv class was, oh, was dynamite. If you've never done an improv class, uh, they're hard to do because it, you re it really pulls stuff out of you. But it's like anything else. At the end, you're fantastic. And yes, Toastmasters as well, obviously. Uh, and so anyway, so I started studying the competition, right? And I said, what makes these guys successful? What makes them successful? I'm looking for social proof. And I literally was going through the checklist. Website, got it. Business cards, got that. You know, da-da, got it. Da, the toughest one to get was the videos. You know, because it's always hard to capture great moments on stage when there's only three people in the audience. My smallest audience was one person. Yep, I did an event and only one person showed up. And you know what I did? I had a great one-on-one -on -one coaching session with that young man. Again, it's what you do. If you're all in, you're all in. And I remember they apologized to me. And I said to him, this is a true story. They apologized. I said, Victor, I said, you know, uh, well, here's what happened. The story behind the story was that, you know, Pink, the artist, the singer, Pink. So they booked me at a university, right? And they booked me. Like literally, the event was one hour before Pink's concert. So where do you think the major where the students were? They were lined up for pink tickets. So I always tell people I, I opened for pink. But anyway, she took everybody, and I only had that one guy show up who probably didn't like pink. And after I finished with him, I got to be honest, I snuck in. They got me in to go see pink for free, so that was kind of cool. But again, I started. These things will happen. There's going to be so many ups and downs. I, I I got so many horror stories about things that have gone wrong for me. But anyway, get back to my list. So I, I started going through the whole checklist. What do I need? Now imagine what you want to do right now. Think about what you, what you want to do right now. The thing that's right here, you know what I'm talking about? And then ask yourself, have you seen anybody do it? Have you seen anybody become successful doing what you're thinking about? If you have, let the studying begin. If you know what you want and you've seen social proof, let the learning begin. 
let the learning begin. I'm telling you, here, if you don't, if you, I'm going to let you test me right now to show you that I'm not full of it. I want you to go while you're on right here, while you're listening to me, go to my Twitter account. Just go to Victor Antonio, Twitter forward slash Victor Antonio. Go ahead, do it right now. And then tell me how many people I follow. And I want you to write that number down. Tell me how many people I follow. Because I'm going to prove to you that I live by what I practice. Or I practice what I say, rather. Right? So go there and tell me how many, fo- how many people am I following. Not how many followers I have. I think I have like 14,000 followers. Um, but go ahead. And then tell me how many people I'm following. There's a point to this. Because when you find people who are doing what you want to do, then it's just a matter of studying them and really watching what they do. And today it's even easier because you have social media. All I got to do is find these people. Find these people who I want to be like and just track them. And just see, by the way, by, not stalk them or anything, but just figure out what they're doing. And if you've checked online, six is the number, Matt. I know, so only six. There it is, six. And those six people that I'm following, like you know how everybody follows everybody? Like, you know, hey man, you follow me, I follow you. No, I don't, no, I don't do that. That's, that's, that's asinine. You can't follow a thousand people. You can't follow, it makes the whole Twitterverse pointless. But what if we just kind of, it's our secret, right? Nobody else knows this, but it's between us. What if we just follow people who are going to help us get to the next level, who have something to offer? And those are six people I've identified that I like what they're doing that they're teaching me something, right? And so now, now that you know that little secret, try that because now you get the feed of only six people. And these are the people that you want to learn from. Those six people deliver content, develop content that I find, I think, next level, which is why I I track them. So yeah, a lot of you looked it up, man, way to go. So that's my point. So no, again, you know who you want to be. Do I view these people, by the way, a couple of them are sales trainers. Do I view them as com- competition? Don't have competition. Don't have competition because you're going to do it better. You're going to find a way to give it your top spin. You're going to find a way to do it the way you want to do it. Do you know what I mean? So don't worry about competition. You're going to have it all the time. Who cares? Yeah, I got competition. Again, I got competition. I go, yeah, who cares? Victor, you're more expensive than other people. Yeah, who cares? I've had people say, yeah, you're cheaper than other people. Who cares? I like my price. See what I mean? There is a freedom that comes with that, with that mindset that it's not about, you don't live in a world of scarcity. You live in a world of abundance. You've heard this phrase before because there's two mindsets, right? Oh, there's not enough. I'm like, oh, there's plenty. And I'm telling you right now, there's plenty. If you have a passion that offers value to the market, I am telling you, there's plenty. If you have a passion that has no value to the market, scarcity, right? You hope, you better hope you get lucky. And so kind of keep that in mind. Anyway, the third thing is, and this is where the value piece ties together, is that these are your clients. So then I started asking myself, here's what I want to do. Here are my perceived competitors in the market. Again, mindset wise, they're not competitors, but these are people who are doing what I want to do. And then, why are my clients hiring them? Why are my clients hiring them, right? Now, let me slice and dice this one a little bit. And if I'm going too deep, man, tell me, I'll pull back. I'll pull back and give you uh, lighter stuff, but let me, uh, great. Now, right here, you see this little bump overlap right here? You see this overlap right here, right there? That's where your competitors have what your client wants but you don't have it. This is known as a disadvantage, right? So for example, I'll give you one, uh, because I love the guy, he's been around forever and a day, Brian Tracy. Great sales trainer, great content. Like, you know, one one of the, if there's like godfathers in selling, this guy's one of them, right? Uh, And so I know that they hired him for his vast experience and his book, The Psychology of Selling. I don't have that. I don't have that. I can't get that, right? Now, right here, right here, this middle one right here, now, this is important, I'm telling you, this is like an MBA in a box. Right here, 
you have it, the competitor has it, and your client wants it. This is known as parity. Parity means the customer can't tell the difference. That's not good. I mean, it's good that you're parity because you're, you're the same now, right? So I can tell Brian, I have a book like Brian, okay, parity, but there's still not a difference. Well, he has more experience, but you get the idea. So where do you want to play? Well, I think you want to play in the green spot here. This is where you want to find your messaging. So right here, here's what I have, right? They don't have it, but my client wants it. This right here, if I can move this little triangle thing out, that right there is my advantage. All right, so I said to myself, again, this is me thinking like a business guy, thinking for myself. And I said, okay, so what's my advantage? And so then I said, one, two, three. What are three things? Because I'm all about the three. Psychology has shown over and over again, it's all about the three, man. Anyway, I'm a little thirsty, man. Holy buckets, we've been going at this for an hour already. What was the missing piece you identified? Tarun, you're in the game, man. I'm getting there, I'm getting there, I'm getting there, man, I'm getting there. And so now I had to figure out how do I differentiate myself in the market, right? How do you differentiate yourself in the market? And so then I, I really had, and again, I can go into a longer story, but let me just try to shorten this up. What, what happened was, as I was thinking about where can I win, you, remember, you know, you ever, you ever uh, I haven't read the book, but I've read excerpts of the book. Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Sun Tzu, The Art of War, right? Still a classic. But I remember reading this, uh, it, was a book on, it, was, it was a book on Western civilization, and they got into this little dissertation about Sun Tzu. Again, I didn't read the book, but they had an excerpt from the book. And one of, the, one of his philosophies, one of his tenets, rules of winning, he said, attack your enemy where they're weakest. Attack your enemy where they're weakest. I don't know why that's stuck in there. Again, like a drill that some just drills in your head. You're like, it's there. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. You ever have, has that ever happened to you that you read something and you go, my God, that's a great concept. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but it's a great concept. Right there, right? So I said, where can I, where can I attack my enemy if I perceive them as enemies? They're not, but you know what I mean, right? These, this is my competition. Where are they weakest? And I realized, first I had to figure out where I was the weakest. They've written a lot of books. I have not. I'm not going to catch up. There's no way I'm catching up, right? No way I'm catching up. Then I go, what else? What else can I do? Well, they've been around, you know, 15, 20, maybe more years, you know. I can't win there. They got me on experience. And so, yeah, Divided Cocker would be another one, Arvin. And I said, but I go, uh, I go, where can I win? Where can I win? And little by little, th this started dawning on me. I said, what can I do better than them? What can I do if not as good as them, just a little bit? I'm talking about like eh, that much better. That's all I need. I just need a gap, a daylight, right? A gap of daylight just to be better. And so the first thing that hit me was that I said, well, damn it, I'm an engineer. I know those guys aren't engineers. I also knew, this was interesting, that a lot of these guys who teach sales training and again, I'm not trying to be disparaging. Again, I'm just noticing what I see in the market. That's all I'm doing. And I'll just say some of these sales trainers out there have no real experience, have no real corporate experience, have not carried the bag, as they said, have not like felt that, you know, that, that, that pressure of a quota, right? Have never managed sales teams, right? Have never had to grow market, have never traveled internationally, had to sell internationally into different cultures. I'm like, okay, there's, there's an advantage here somewhere. Right? So then I realized, wait a minute, I really have to leverage. The first one was the corporate experience, right? I really had to drive that one home. And part of that corporate experience I rolled into that was my engineering degree and MBA, right? These are things I could use. This is what I'm saying. It still paid dividends off. But that was, again, so that was still packaged on the corporate experience. But I knew that that was an advantage, right? So that was one advantage. Two, at the time, a lot of them weren't doing videos. They weren't. They just simply weren't doing videos. They were writing articles. They were writing blogs. And I go, huh, video. And it was, it was around, the, the guy who really pushed me forward was Gary Vaynerchuk. I read his book, Crush, was it Crush It or Crushing It? Probably Crush It. And I, when I read that book and he was talking about video, Google, buying YouTube, 
He said, video, video, video. To this day, I still thank Gary Vee for that because it was like, when I read that, it just gave me the courage because up at that point, I was still struggling. I mean, I was growing. By the way, so the story is, I did 17,000 my first six months. Then the next year, I did like 56,000. I think, I think it was like, yeah, it was like 17, 56, and then I made over $100,000, right? And we're good after that. And so, but still, it was like that, right? And so, then I said, video. Now, you know I'm not lying. Why? Because if you go back 10, maybe 12 years now, you're gonna find my videos. I got over, let me see, publicly that I share on YouTube, I have, I think, over 1,100, I think it's more like 1,200 videos total. If I count the ones in the academy which are different than the ones in sales, well, the, what's in the Sales Influence YouTube, those are like general videos, but my real course is I have over 500 here. So I have over 500 in my Sales Velocity Academy, and then I have about 11, uh, 1,100. So I've got 1,600 videos, 1,600. Divide that by, I don't know, who knows? Let me see, 12 years? That's how many I've, I've, I've done. So then I said video. Remember, remember my mindset here. All in, right? All in. So I said all in. Let's do all in, right? So uh, all in. Now, by the way, keep in mind, let me do a small pause here. See this? You don't see that. You don't see all the stuff I have all around me in the studio. Am I still doing a video? Yeah. But what am I doing, though? What am I doing? I'm trying to evolve faster than my competition. That's why you see this here. That's why I'm doing more live streams than anybody else in the sales field right now. See what I'm doing? I'm living it. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving this to you like because I'm living it right now again because that's what business is. And so I'm going to this board. Uh, Grant Cardone uses a similar board like that. He was the one that gave me idea. So got to give him credit. And But I, I looked at the board for a couple of years, wasn't sure. But then live streaming starts becoming very popular amongst gamers. I go, I think that's where the market going, is going. So then I go, okay, Grant's using this board. Uh, he's using a different board. He's got a jam board by Google. Uh, and then I said, but yeah, I like the way he used the board. And then I see live stream coming online. And then I see what gamers are doing with their studios. And I'm going, wait a minute. I think this is going to be the next thing. Let's move away from green screen. I got my green screen there. But I said, I have to evolve with the market. So keep that in mind. You always have to go evolve, right? So then I said, corporate experience, video. This third one, you're not going to believe, but I think you will if you really listen to me. And it's in, by the way, it's in the movie, The Motivator, the documentary. If you came in late, it's in there. And so in The Motivator, I talk about, I was driving to a university. It was in Orlando, Valdosta. No, it wasn't Valdosta. I forgot the name of it. Valencia, Valencia College, Florida, Orlando. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I, I, I got, you know how you, sometimes you feel like you're just hitting the ceiling. You just can't break that. You know what I mean? It's just like not gone. And so I said, something's got to change. And then I figured out, okay, what can I control? What can I not control? You know, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Do you guys remember that? You know, Stephen Covey, who wrote the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Again, when I saw this model, I go, what a beautiful model. And he said this, if this is out here are things you can't control. He says, these are, these are concerns, right? That you may have. This is, this is the market. This is politics. These are government regulations. These are the stock market. These are things you can't control. It says right here is your circle of influence. And your job is to focus here, not here. And your job is to push out and expand what you can control. And that's your job. What can you control? You can control your behavior. You can control your activities, right? These are things you can control, right? Your mindset, what you do, your activities. So then I said, what can I control? Because I can't control what people pay. I can't control how people perceive other speakers who have been in the business longer than me. And then something hit me. To, to complete the triangle, I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my style of speaking. He says, what I'm going to try to do is blend like, like content, like real content, like science-based content. And then I'm going to try to blend it with humor. Right? That was, that was, that was my secret sauce. So I said, if I can do content plus humor, if I can do that content plus humor, I believe I can create a differentiating factor in the market. I can take my business experience, my background, again, and then I can add that flavor, right? I can add 
that and then transmit it via video where I could, that got me going, All right? Because my mind was focused on that, just trying to get there, man. Just trying to get there. How do I get it in? Because when you're going after something, again, you know they're doing it. Somebody's doing it, so you have the social proof. Because you have the social proof, your job now is to figure out how do I do it? What are they doing? Start with that question. What are they doing? And then go through the checklist and begin to do everything they're doing. If they wrote a book, write a book if you really want. So let's say, I don't know, let's say you want to go into some type of business. Pick a business that you want to go into, right? And then just start asking and looking around to see who's successful in that business. And if you find people who are successful, especially if you find many people, by the way, don't be intimidated if there's a lot of people who are successful. You know what that means? That means there's a market. Some people look at it and go, that's a lot of competition. Negative mindset. When I see a lot of people going after something, I go, damn, there's business there. Let's go get some of that, right? So it's a different mindset. And so I want you to have that mindset. It's just a simple, you know, switch it. So anyway, this is how I did it. When I started really leveraging this, remember, I copied everything they were doing. By copy, I mean I mimicked. Book, write a book. Got to write articles once a week. Okay, that sounds like a lot, but I'll write articles. I mean, I suck at it, but I'll write them. Write the articles, right? And I went through the whole checklist. And then I started figuring out where can I win? And I realized I'm not the best at writing articles, which is why you hardly see an article from me. But I do videos, right? And I love doing videos. And so again, I found my differentiating factor and that began the momentum. Do you guys have any questions? Is this cool? I don't usually go this way, but I thought it might be cool on a Friday just to chat with you and just hang out. So if you have any questions, man, let me just take a little break here. Uh, motivator, where's that movie? Go on YouTube, type in Victor Antonio, The Motivator. Juca, you'll find it there. Let me know if you find it. And if you do find it, post the link, but it's on YouTube. Uh, it's a really good movie. I mean, it'll, it follows me around the whole bit. You know, it's, it's good to see the family. The kids were young back then. Uh, so it's really interesting. So I'm, you, you see me living it. And I'm, I was invited to do this speech. Uh, what's, what's, funny, what's funny about that video? What's funny about that video? I can say this now because it's, you know, some time has passed, right? Uh, that's not copying, but being inspired. Deepak, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, well said. Well placed. And so in the movie, The Motivator, uh, what's interesting was, is that you got to watch the movie. Just get some popcorn tonight, man. Just pop. It'll, by the way, it's only like 55, 60 minutes. It goes like that. Uh, so you join Toastmaster after looking at competitor or while identifying differentiators. I joined Toastmasters. Uh, let me see. I wanted to vote like that forever. What is it and where can I get one? This is a vibe, V I B E, like V I B E dot US. And I'll put the information also in the description. Vibe. Uh, it's, it's probably the, Steven is probably the most cost competitive out there. Uh, that's why I picked it. Uh, if you do the jam board, the jam board was like 6,500. This is like 3,500. I know some of you say that's a lot of money. Trust me, I'll get my money back. All in, man. All in. See, when you're all in and you know where you're going, you're just all in. You just go for it. And so, uh, Tarun, I joined Toastmasters after I saw Zig Ziglar speak. I was still in corporate America, actually. And I tell people this story, true story. When I went through Toastmasters, I, I found my, my gift of speaking, what I considered my gift. And that also began to translate into my promotions within corporate America because I became a better communicator. And I remember my bosses, every time we had a client come into town, they're like, well, who's going to do the presentation for the client? And they're like, get Victor. He can do it. Because they knew I knew how to talk. I'm telling you, Toastmasters, being able to communicate, public presentation, public speaking, the best investment you can make. So uh, Deepak, thank you. You're awesome as well, man. I think it's in VA's channel. So good artists borrow, great artists steal. <laughs> but you, you know what it is, is that you just have to, you know, you, you just want to look at what somebody has. I, I like the inspired phrase because I'll look at something and then you always give credit where credit's due. I told you, I was inspired to get the board by Greg Cardone when he, with his jam board. And, but it, it just sat there for a year or two before I said, how am I going to use this board? Um, but, but I think if you can grab something and then give it your flavor, I think that's what people want. We all stand on, on, on the shoulders of other people, right? Uh, like I said, I'm a, I'm a fan of Zig Ziglar. Uh, Jim Rohn, I think, is just one of the most underestimated speakers. 
Uh, and I, I would complete that trinity with Ogmandino. Have you guys ever read Ogmandino? Do you know who I'm talking about? Do you guys know who he is? Ogmandino. Uh, just spell it. If you don't know who this man is, uh, you should look him up. So, you know, everybody goes to like the Norman Vincent Peale or, you know, all these other popular guys. Ogmandino's my guy. Do you know what I mean? Uh, he's written The Greatest Salesman in the World. He also wrote The Greatest Miracle in the World, which is my favorite of all the Ogmandino's books. If, if you only have to pick one, read The Greatest Miracle in the World. Now, if you read The Greatest Miracle, that's the one I want you to get. Greatest Miracle in the World, right? In there, there's a character by the name of Simon. When you read the book by Ogmandino, The Greatest Miracle in the World, and you figure out what Simon does, you will understand me clearly. You will even understand this live stream better after you read the book. How's that for mystery? Is that enough mystery? So anyway, so, so hopefully I answered that question. Yeah, the board's cool. Uh, so the link uh, for the, did you find it? That's the link? Okay, you guys found it, great. I've watched that many people are branding themselves instead of their companies. Is that necessary nowadays or just another strategy? I kind of like promoting my company instead. You know, I think they go hand in hand. Uh, I would promote my company, obviously, but the thing is I would use that as almost like, um, you know, gadget, double O. You're working for a company. Uh, yeah, you could promote yourself, but remember that a lot of that respect people are going to give you because you work for somebody else is based on what your company's doing. So the more you can tie what you're doing with your company and how you're helping your company grow and what they're doing that's so spectacular. Again, that value for value. Remember, the company is giving you a gig, right? I think you should reciprocate by giving the company some attention and some love. So as you're putting out content, I would talk about who I work for and the cool things we're doing in the company. So they can go glove in hand, you know what I mean? You can do them both. I think that's, I, that's the way I would do it. Uh, Wasim Akram, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate the words. Uh, Juka got it. Ogmandino, awesome. I mean, I didn't, am I, by the way, I'm playing with this new software again. Just I'm getting used to it, man. So thank you, man. So cool. Ogmandino. Um, the greatest, da, 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 yes. Yeah, the Og books are good, man. They're just, Ogmandino is very well known in Latin America. I didn't know that. There's a guy in Latin America, a gadget. I, mean, I don't know if you know him. His name is uh, Carlos. I don't want to say Conejo, Carlos Conejo, something like that. Miguel, Miguel Angel Conejo, something like that. Just a great speaker. He passed away like three or four years ago. Just a great Spanish speaker. I mean, just, uh, so yes, I do study the speakers in Spanish. There's a, uh, there's a, a young man, forgot who is gadget. He's like, a, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's from Peru, but he's of Japanese descent. And I can't remember his name. Oh, he's only like 40 years old. I just, I think he's a beast, but he's, you know. All right, All right cool. But uh, that's the book. The Greatest Miracle in the World is up my altar. Oh, really, Deepak? My man, see that? Great minds think alike. So anyway, um, I got a lot of content to go through. We've been on there so long, though. Let me see where we're we at right now. An hour and a half. Cool. Um, so what I want to do is, so this is where, you, again, I gave you the mapping, right, of what I did. So once I knew this, right, the one, two, three messages that I had, right, corporate America, video, right, use some humor with real content. And then I said, how do I begin to market that? And so the videos became my outlet. That's really how I started. I started marketing myself. Again, Sun Tzu, attack your enemy where they're weakest, right? And so I knew that a lot of people weren't doing videos. So I remember I would drive from here, because uh, I didn't have the, uh, the tools here or the setting. I would drive to, I, I met a guy named Rick, uh, who ran uh, some, you know, some like corporate offices, and he would let me use the training room to record my videos. So I would actually go over there, take my small camera, you know, go or set up a tripod, and I would record these videos. And it were three to five minute videos. So if you go all the way back to my first video on YouTube, you'll see it's me holding a laptop because it had a webcam on there, and I recorded my first video holding my laptop. I swear to you, that was my first video. And so what happened was I started doing the video thing. And then I started like tagging my videos. You know what I mean by tagging your videos? You know, tagging them for, you know, I was doing a lot of search engine optimization. Search engine optimization is essentially just tagging the keywords so that the, the search engine spiders, the algorithms will find your videos. And then 
couple of videos I put out, man, it was like, it's so discouraging, man, because when you first start out with the videos, it was like, okay, there's three views. <laughs> You know, there's five views. You go back down, you know, one view, two view, three view, 10 views. And it, it was very discouraging at the beginning. So if you saw my uh, live stream about how it takes time to build something, I talked about that in one of my other live streams. Uh, that was it. You have to really commit. See, this is why this is important. Because there will be times where you will doubt yourself. Not times. I mean, times. Like, like multiple times where you will doubt yourself. And if you're not all in, you will give up. That's why I think it's important for you to really consider what you want to do. Think about what you want to do. Really like just absorb it. Reflect on it. It may take a month. It may take a year for all I know. But you'll feel that click. Because it's like a click. It just go, you know, and it's like, you go, oh, we're in. You know what I mean? It's, I can't explain. You'll have, to, you'll have to get there. And when it clicks, then you'll move them all in. And then you'll begin to see things you didn't see before. And then now you're going to get excited because you're moving towards something. But remember, you do it at your pace. You do it your way. You know, it's like a, I, I remind people that Bruce Lee saying, Bruce Lee, when it came to learning something, he said, and listen to this phrase, because I, I love this phrase. He said, absorb what is useful, discard what is not, and then add what is uniquely yours. Now think about that. Absorb what is useful, discard what is not, and add what is uniquely yours. As I'm talking to you right now, that's how you should be thinking. Whatever Victor's saying, let me absorb what I think is useful, because you're not going to find it all useful. I'm going to discard what I don't find useful, but then I'm going to add what is uniquely me. And then that is how you become good. And that is when you... See, the thing is, it's like I, I believe that the toughest road to success is the road back to you. Do you know what I mean by that? It's kind of a heavy saying because what happens is society tells you what you should be, how you should act. Schools tell you, they condition you. Studies have shown this, that kids, kids start out school and by the third to fifth grade, I think, I think it's fifth grade, all their enthusiasm has, has begun to dampen, right? Because it just, just basically burns it out of you. And then by the time you get to high school, college, you, you're buying into the script, right? So now you're in that job. One of the things I didn't tell you that's in the movie is that, so I get my engineering degree and I did the engineering degree for the money, which was a good move. But then I realized three years into my engineering degree, I didn't like doing it, right? That's why I moved into sales, sales eventually. But I, I, I asked myself, why did I get an engineering degree? And I said, for the money. That was obviously, we were poor, we needed money. But once you do that, what happens is, it was like after that, so I graduated, got my job, three years into my job, it's like, I don't wanna do it anymore. And I remember that was like a real low point for me. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you spent all that time. Now make it good money, right? Make it good money so we're you know, not poor. Uh, but you, it's one of those things where you like, I remember sitting in the cubicle and going, what have I done? I spent all this time, took me five years to get through college, five and a half to be specific, graduated, got a job three years into this gig, I don't like it. I don't even want to do this anymore, right? And I remember feeling lost. And I think that's when I started reading a lot of books on philosophy, you know? You know, so I read, you know, the existentialists, the hermeneutics, you know, uh, the economists, different types of economists, you know, and, you know, the Austrian School of Economics, you know, Joseph Schumpeter, all these crazy dudes, right? And I was just reading stuff because I was, tr I was looking for something. I even read a book on, uh, I remember, uh, Questions to a Zen Master by Taizen Deshimaru, right? I was reading that. Uh, read, you know, read like excerpts of the Bible. Even looked at the Quran, believe it or not. Uh, and I was just, even the, was it the Bhagavad Gita? You know, and just started reading some of that. And I, so I started studying some of the, um, the speakers that were like, God, they're like Wayne Dyer. Uh, who was the other guy? There was another guy. It was Wayne Dyer. And I started listening to these guys. I remember listening to Earl Nightingale. If you heard Earl Nightingale's, the Greatest Secret. Have you ever listened to Earl Nightingale's The Greatest Secret? You should really listen to Earl Nightingale's The Greatest Secret. It's on YouTube for free. Got a deep voice, beautiful voice. But I remember studying all these guys, and it wasn't until I came across Ayn Rand that I go, oh, I get it. It's like this, poof, this explosion went off in my head, and I started seeing things for what they were. And at that point, I began to shift to not to do what other people wanted me to do, 
but to do what I wanted to do. That was the beginning of, if, the, if here was I, society had taken me on this journey of what they wanted me to do. And now I had to figure out how to come all the way back to me. That's why I say, always say that the toughest road to success is the road back to you. Because, you know, you're, you know, society fills you with a lot of stuff that you, you know, it's just not you. And then you, you're confused. You don't know who you are. And because you don't know who you are, you just, you just feel lost. You wander. The majority of people are just wandering. I mean, they're just like automatons, right? They don't even know what they want because they haven't thought about it. They've been conditioned to do what the script tells them to do. Okay? I'm not saying there's no value in that. Of course there is. But how many people, I mean, study, what was the last day? It was a study about how many people were unhappy. And I think the number was like 78% of the people are either unhappy. It was something like 78% of the population that's working is either unhappy or, or be willing to get another job. That's what it was. They're either unhappy or are willing to take another job. 78%. Let's just call that 80. So 80% of the people are not happy with what they're doing and would rather be working somewhere else because they're not happy. That's a big number. That's failure. If you think about it, it's kind of heavy if you think about it. It's, I don't know. What do you guys got down here? Uh, Seth Godwin says that exemplary products need minimal marketing. You mean uh, Seth Godin uh, without the W. Seth Godin, good stuff. Purple Cow, good book, right? Uh, should we put more of our efforts into creating a stellar product rather than trying to sell a rather common product or service? No. No, because you're not going to create a stellar product. It's like chasing a unicorn, my friend. It's a chasing a unicorn. So, you know, too often, I mean, so, and by the way, uh, so this one, P-Base 36, let's just talk about this one because I think this is where a lot of people also fall into the hole. Two, the, many years ago I, heard, ago, I heard this phrase. I may have used it already in the live stream uh, and in other ones, but I said, never aim for perfection, aim for success. Never aim for perfection, aim for success. Now, what does that mean? You know, if you think about it, again, another thing I heard, I go, what does that mean? But then I, the more I thought, I go, oh, that's just brilliant. Because what happens is, if you're waiting to find the perfect product, if you're waiting to design the perfect product, if you're waiting for the perfect situation, perfect storm, it's never going to happen. It just doesn't happen. Even if it did happen, within a week or two, it's unraveled all over again. So I believe in the 80% rule. When I put out a video, for example, I didn't want my video to be perfect. I have people criticize my videos. They, they still criticize me. I'll probably get a couple of thumbs down here. Who cares? The problem is, is that a lot of the people overthink things because they overthink them. They never do them. I believe in the 80% rule. Is it 80% good enough? Yeah, good enough. Now, if you're type A, this is not going to work for you. I get that. I'm not type A. It works for me. I don't aim for perfection. I aim for success. And along the way, I just get better. I started doing these live streams May 4th. I believe is the date. May 4th. So a little over a month. You go look at the first one. Go look at my first live stream. Kind of sucks, actually. Even my bandwidth is off. Bandwidth wasn't good. There was a couple of things off. Now, if I waited for it to be perfect, I wouldn't have started. And people were saying, well, Victor, I, I, friends actually called me. This is a true story. Friends were calling me. I said, dude, uh, yeah, I saw what you put online. Uh, I, your bandwidth's off a little bit. I said, yeah, thank you. I, I noticed that myself. I got, I got to get a couple of things going in. So I, I had to add extra routers, up my service, the whole bit. And then they're like... You know, it does. It seems like your your audio on your mic. People are like, you know, and again, just trying to help me, right? But my point is, if I had waited to be perfect, I never would have started. So where do I think I am now? So I started probably at like 50, 60 percent, pretty good. With this one, I think maybe I'm like where I want to be. I'm like at 80, 90 percent. There's still room for improvement, but I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep screwing things up, uh, you know, and that's how I do it. So be careful that you don't fall in that, in that perfection mind trap, that you never get started because you never find that stellar product. And let's be honest again, you and I, P-Base, 3-6, you and I, man. I say, even if you found a great product, somebody already has it. And even if you found a slight differentiator, somebody's going to copy it. Therefore, why don't we sell a product? Instead of trying to find the best product, why don't we try to find a good product that will help clients? Because it's not about the product, it's what it can do for other people. I mean, if we go by your logic, why sell water? Water is a pretty common product. Yeah. Coca-Cola is making a lot of money with water, right? 
So there's nothing wrong with providing something that isn't the best of the best, because not all of us can sell the best of the best. So I don't know if that helps, but there it is, man. Gadget 00, I guess it may be Yokio Kenji. That is the guy is, is going up like fire. That dude, is, is, he's awesome, man. He's, his stories are just, you know, I've never seen so much talent in a young man, and so I, I really like him, man. Uh, by the way, I used to call him Godwin also, so between you and me, previous. Can't mimic your extrovert charisma. No, you can't. But, Arvin, did you know, did you know that if you talk to my high school mates, even my elementary school, high schools, I was an introvert all through high school, like an introvert. Maybe you're on a, I think high school, I started coming out of it. Maybe in college is when I started really coming out of it. I guess by coming out, I'm like, hey, not that. But I go back to Toastmasters. When I started speaking in public and was forced to do that, it's like I found my voice. But if you talk to my friends, they, they're like, where'd that come from? Most, by the way, people who see me today on my live streams or watch my TV show uh, or watch my documentary, they're like, where'd that come from? Because he was really quiet. I was like a mouse in high school, just a mouse. Board is very cool, no doubt. What kind of camera is needed for streaming? You could, uh, right now, you could use a lot of cameras. Uh, the one I'm using right now is an, is an AX11 Canon video camera. It's an, yeah, it's XA11 Canon. And the reason I chose that one, first of all, a, friend, a good friend of mine who does videography recommended it. Uh, a lot of, I got over here, I got a second camera, it's a DSLR, I'm not using it yet, I'm still practicing with that. That's where the 10% kicks in, I got other things I wanna do. But this one is, uh, it's a good camera, it's like 1200 bucks, but you don't have to spend this much money. There's a lot of great cameras in the, uh, in the, in the three to 500 range, maybe 600 bucks, that I would start out with. So I started out with a, like a $100 camera when I first started out. So find something that's reasonable. But what I love about this camera, if you wanna look it up, it has two XLR plugs for two microphones. And so XLR gives you a little higher quality than a USB connector. And again, you know, without getting too much detail, it's pretty cool. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita, thank you, man. Thank you, I knew it was something like that. I was close, wasn't I? This was almost like 25 years ago though, man. So, so thank you. Uh, good mic camera that will make your video. Okay, I just mentioned that, so I think I gave you that. Uh, will make your video computer still can edit. So I use, so if you want to, so I gave you that, right? The X, the XA11 Canon. And so I use this Joe Rogan mic for interviews. I got that one. This is not the one I'm using right now, but I got this one set up. So I started out with this one. This is SM7B, SM7B by, by Sure, S-H-U-R-E, right? So I use that when I'm just doing like a, welcome to the Sales Influence Podcast, where we talk about that one, right? And so right above here, I got a, I bought a Sennheiser mic. Uh, I went through like three or four mics, and I was like, finally, my son really was in my ears, like, you know, because he's, I'm, you know, you know what the word frugal means? Frugal. I'm frugal. I don't like spending money. I don't like this. And this is like, even though I just say it like this, is I really had to think about this. But again, I go, are you committed or not? Because I'm frugal. I don't like spending a lot of money. My my son said, you're gonna have to spend the money on a mic. So I got a Sennheiser, don't ask me the model name, uh, and that was like a $1,000 mic. Uh, so it's an investment. See, but again, I'm all in, man. And I, I need to take my game to the next level because you millennials and you Gen Xers are kicking my back, backside, and I just got to keep running. So I'm doing this all the time, right? Plus, the technology is evolving. You have to evolve with it. So, yep, never aim for perfection, man. Hey, Chad, welcome. Uh, uh, my similar philosophy is version one is better than version none. Ah, that's cool. <laughs> I'm going to steal that, by the way. Version one is better than version none. I mean, I think, Deepak, would you agree that a lot of ideas just die, you know, they die right there on the desk or at the kitchen table. These are people that have put something together, but they never execute on them. I know people who just, they just keep talking about what they're going to do. Do something. Throw yourself out there. You will be criticized. You will fail. You will suck. You will lose money. Yeah, part of the process. You you know, as soon as you understand that's part of the process, you're like, okay, let's do this. But, you know, there was that, somebody had the phrase, I don't know who came up with it, but fail fast forward. Fail fast forward, right? Fail fast forward. And I've always liked that phrase because it's like, get the mistakes out of the way as soon as you can. Make all the mistakes you want to make. But eventually, like anything else, if I know somebody's doing it, I want to do that. I know somebody's doing it. I know they got there somehow. I just got to figure this out. Uh, I mean, this morning, I spent... The whole, like like three hours fighting with this thing. This thing allows me to change 
a lot of stuff there. In fact, can I test it? Because this is my new gadget. So not this, not that. This right here. So I'm, let me see. Let me see if this works. So this should actually zoom into the board. Let's see if it works. Oh, check that out. I just did that today, man. I learned how to do that today. Right? This one will zoom into my face. Watch this. Boom. Ooh, that worked too. Oh, she's like a little kid with a toy here. And then uh, this one's just, I haven't figured this one out, but it's going to put some yellow next to me right there. Bam. So I can write something here like this. And so, like literally, and then this one I figured out today. Look, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. So I spent like literally all morning just trying to figure this damn thing out. It's called a stream deck that gamers use. So I had to learn how to use that. And so it's like, I, you know, and I'm watching videos, like trying to learn how to do this program in the thing. And so just, you know, I struggle with this stuff. Like all this stuff looks not, looks easy now that I got it all going, but I struggle. I mean, it was, it's, it's a fight. It's a constant fight just to keep up. Gary V says, execution is the name of the game. I believe that too. Perfection is a myth. Progress is key. Love it, man. Version one is better than version none. That's too much fun. That's too much fun. Will cost me more than selling existing solution. Love it, man, Frank. Uh, some great comments. The Canon M50 is what a lot of YouTubers are recommending. Okay, cool, man. I didn't know that. I'll have to look at that one. So, yeah, I'll put that dash. I should pull some of the comments up. Sorry, I haven't been doing that. Sorry about that. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate that. Uh, any chance of a guest speaker in the future, like Jordan Belfort? I like Jordan Belfort. I'd love to have a conversation with the man. Uh, I got to figure out, Brian, how to do like, you know, like a sp split screen here. And so, like I told you, I've just been putting this together for the last month or so, so I'm still like crawling, you know. But yeah, wouldn't that be a cool conversation? I think it'd be a great conversation, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, this is Brian asked me the question right here. Uh, Jordan Belfort, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, uh, I know he did an interview with, uh, he's done a lot of interviews with, with some speakers. Like, I, I think he did one with Grant Cardone about a, a couple of months ago, six months ago. But he's done a lot with a lot of people. Uh, uh, Patrick Betts, what's his first name? Mike, is it Michael Patrick Betts? He's got a website called Value Tame. I'd love to do an interview with him as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of people I love to kind of interview. So, there is a chance. How's that? And if it is, man, I'll let you know, Okay. Uh, fail fast, fail forward. There you go. Frugal is good. Thank you. Thank you. Echo again? Where? No. Do you hear an echo? Okay. All right. No echo, right? We're good. Okay. No, we're fine. Okay. Uh, just so you know, I watched so many of your videos when I was green in selling. All right. T.W. Timothy, man. I hope you made money. About time to get a studio producer. Damn, Brian. Just, I'm trying, I'm trying to get my game together here, man. Here's my problem, Brian. I got I got an issue. I like technology. I like learning this stuff. And I, I realize that I move faster. Like right now, like this whole cast right here, this whole um, production, not this, the production, but this live stream. Uh, I mean, literally, I'm downstairs watching a movie with my wife. I said, I think I'm going to go upstairs and do a live cast. Hit the, you know, I mean, it's like I'm spontaneous that way. So, But maybe down the road, man. You may be right. You may be right. I'm listening to you, Brian. You may be right. What would you be the latest scalable, sellable business in your opinion? I have no idea, DIJ. There's so many businesses. I, again, I think if you're looking for a sellable business, I, I, you're, you're, you're again, you're falling into the trap of the matrix. Do you know what I mean? I think it's easy to find a business to make money. But when you get to the money, it's not going to be what you think. And I still say work it backwards. What do you think you'd like to do, DIJ? Do you know what I mean? And then how would you scale it? What if you just focus on that? Because in the end, remember, I, I, I got so many stories of people who work for companies, companies sold, there's a merger, there's an acquisition, something doesn't go right, partners stole the money, market goes south, whatever it may be, and it isn't theirs. They have no control. They have no, you know, they have no control. They don't, don't hold the reins, and they wind up being a victim of somebody else's dream. So keep that in mind. You're only as good as you're willing to be bad. Hey, there you go. Um, okay, question. With your vast experience, have you ever done a speaking engagement unprepared? That is such an unfair question. The answer is yes, I have. I have. Um, but, well, I don't know. By unprepared, it's, it's, okay, so let me define unprepared. I knew what I was going to talk about. I just didn't prepare for it because I've gotten to that level where I'm pretty good. You know what I mean? And so, but I've never, never not studied a company. I never do that because they're paying you. So you better know the company. But there's been times where uh, the way my brain works, TJ, is that sometimes 
when I'm going to go do a speech, I can't think about the speech. I mean, I know I look at the company, I study them, I pretty much have the business models of what they have. And I, by the way, I always ask my customers, what are the top three things you're concerned about? Or three, five things. They usually tell me. And so that gives me an indication of where to go. And so usually it's the night before that just up here, something happens. And maybe it's because it's been sitting in my brain for a week. And then I can't explain it. I typically do not sleep the night before a speech. I'm the guy that's up about uh, at two in the morning. I mean, literally, I'll be up at two in the morning writing the speech out, laying it out. Not because I don't know. I'm trying to find that certain special something, that what I call that top spin, to give it, make it special. So if that's unprepared, then yeah. But I don't think that is. I think it's just I'm trying to find that the moment of inspiration. For some reason, when time is compressed and I know I have to deliver it, it just comes together for me. So that's the best answer I got. But I don't think I've ever been unprepared. Like, I don't, hey, I don't know what you guys want. No, none of that. I always ask the customer. By the way, the secret to that, TJ, to being successful at speaking, one of the secrets is ask your customers what they want. Why did you? Why do you want to hire me? I said, well, give me three to five things you think I can help your your salespeople, you know, work through. They go, Victor, if you can talk about this, 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 this is what we'd like. Bam. Well, I got. I have so much content that I can just knock those out easily. Uh, and I got stories about last minute. Uh, Bet David, Chad, you're right. I, but there's a third. There's a Patrick in there. Patrick Bet David. Is that it? So I love his channel, man. Great content, man. Just massive followers, man. Just amazing guy. I have not met him either, by the way. Uh, yeah, Patrick Bet David of Valuetainment. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, Hong Kong in the house again. T.W. Timothy. Thank you, man. Uh, yeah, Stephen, Ken. Okay. Uh, cool, cool. By the way, I like Loom. I talked about Loom, I think, last week, right? Loom.com is where you can attach a video to an actual document. And let me see. I agree about good enough is good enough, but if you created anti-gravity tomorrow, you wouldn't need much marketing. It's hard to innovate. That's why creators out team everyone else. I agree, man. I agree. I mean, look, if you have the money and the resources, if you're like an Elon Musk, well, okay, that's another level. Do you know what I mean? I mean, that's just a, that's another level, right? And so you're absolutely right. You don't get there by yourself. You need to work with somebody else. So that's why uh, when I started this the live stream, I said, let me frame this for entrepreneur, small business owners. That's how I frame this. But you're absolutely right. I mean, big things like that. I mean, you know, yeah, that's a, that's another level. So you're absolutely, I wouldn't even argue with you. You're absolutely right. And if we're talking about shooting somebody in space, uh, good enough is not good enough, if you know what I mean, right? There you want to be almost at 101% if there is such a thing. So I agree with you. We're on the same page, man. Uh, but anyway. Let me see what else. I think that's it, man. I, as far as I want to go, because I think we've been on here almost two hours. Yeah, almost two hours. So I think I'm gonna wrap up with that. Uh, I had more stuff to go through, but I don't. I don't know if I want to pull an all-nighter, man. My voice will die. I just want to relax. Um, but hopefully that story. Watch the motivator. I think you should watch the motivator. I think it'll be a cool thing to watch. Uh, and it's, it's like I said, there's a lot of stuff in there about the business. And should you be a speaker? I think you should. It's a great. It's a great business. On that note, guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Uh, again, if you haven't subscribed, do so. But also what I really like is, you know, tell me what you think of this format, um, the content, what you'd like to hear from me, not hear from me. You know, do's, don'ts, ups, downs, sideways, doesn't matter. But then the only favor I always ask, one favor, that's the only favor I'm asking, is share this with at least just one person, okay? So anyway, have a fantastic night. Back at you, Juca, Timothy, Brian. One day, Jordan Belfort and I, I'm telling you, then I'm going to invite you personally, okay? Thank you, guys. Have a great night. Take care.